Hello, my name is Andy and I am the Village Idiot. I'm armed with a car and a GoPro and an unhealthy amount of time on my hands. I'm using that time to attempt to visit every civil parish in England. You're watching the East Riding of Yorkshire series. Together with the unparished city of Hull, it forms the county of the same name. There's 172 parishes here. Which one are we in today? Welcome back to the East Riding of Yorkshire, everybody, on another cold January morning. Now, this one has been filmed over two days. Now, the reason for that is because, even though it's a very small one, I was losing the light at the end of the first day, and so, really, the only option I had was to split it over two. So I've done part on the 16th of January and part on the 17th of January. I don't think it's gone very well, to be honest with you. I don't think this is going to be one of my best episodes ever. The uh, the light has played a big part, or lack of light has played a big part in this episode. Even so, I'll still do my best to put this on the map like I do every other parish in the East Riding of Yorkshire. Welcome to Harpham. <laughs> Here's my disclaimer for people who may be watching me for the first time. I say things as I would in my native accent and dialect. As a result, I may not pronounce things in the same way as the locals do. Remember, I'm a visitor. It's impossible to know everything. Leave me a comment, spin me a like and bash that subscribe button. Let's get to today's parish video. Harpham, Village of the Harp. This week in the East Riding, we're in the Village of the Harp, or the village where the harp is played. That's why it's literally called Harpham. It's a parish which contains three settlements. Harpham Village itself, Lothorpe, which we briefly saw the beginning of last week as we left Kelp behind, and the tiny village of Ruston Parva on a hill off the A614. It's all set in a slice of lovely countryside between Driffield and Bridlington. This small, peaceful parish has a rich history, and it's heavily associated with the St Quintin family who lend their name to several landmarks. Harpham also has two ancient wells, both of which can be considered famous for different reasons. All three villages have a church, so I hope you like those, they're a major feature here. Now before we get going, I need to say this. People don't seem to realise that I haven't got an infinite amount of time to film these videos. In Harpham itself, I was trying to make up for time I lost on the previous day, thanks to a delay on the road, which meant filming some of this episode really early in the morning, in terribly low light. I've got to be totally honest with you, I seriously considered throwing this one in the bin completely after putting it all together initially, but with a bit of luck, I may just have rescued it. Fingers crossed, let's see shall we? We begin in Lothorpe, which we began to cover at the end of last week's Kelk episode. Lothorpe used to be a civil parish in its own right until it was merged with Harpham in 1935. It doesn't have a lot as villages go. It's primarily residential, having as it does a population of around 100 people. There was a primary school here at one time, but that's no longer in use. It used to have a railway station, as you already know, on the Scarborough to Hull line. It was opened in 1846 by the York and North Midland Railway before closing in January 1970. The line is still active, and we'll be working our way along it in the next few episodes. Perhaps the most important building of all in Lothorpe is its church, although the casual passerby might not even know it has one. The signpost pointing down the lane towards it says Church and Ruined Monastery. That's perhaps overstating things a bit, because there was never a monastery in Lothorpe. What there was instead was a chantry college, served by a rector and six priests, and part of it is in ruins. So let's go and have a look at it. 
So this is one of those churches you've really got to know it's there to know, you know, it, it, that it, it exists. Down a, a track off the road, very well hidden. It does say St. Martin's, a sign that says St. Martin on the road, but you have to have your, your wits about you to actually see the sign because if not, you'll drive straight past it without even realizing it. So now that we're here, we're gonna go and have a look at it. Let's go through this, this gate and see what St. Martin's Church is all about. Dedicated to St. Martin, Lothorpe's church is hidden at the end of a leafy lane, seemingly lost in time. You'll notice straight away there are two distinct parts to this church, one still very much in use, the other a ruin. Let's deal with the active bit first. It's the nave of a medieval church dating from the 12th century and restored in the 19th with a much newer tower. It contains an intriguing table tomb just inside its door which features a remarkable effigy of a couple lying beneath a sheet from which emerges a tree. St Martin's former chancel, a roofless ruin, is open to the elements. There are several worn and crumbling table tombs and grave slabs within it, all mouldering away. Apparently, it was abandoned in the Georgian period as the village diminished in size and wealth. Now it's a rather sad and lonely site. The whole church, ruin and all, is a Grade two listed building. You'll also find in the churchyard here a medieval cross. It was brought here from Killam when that village lost much of its population during the Black Death. Okay, so between uh, last week's Kelk episode and this one, that's Lothorpe, completely covered. It's a strange place, kind of split between two parishes, but there you go. Now, there's another settlement within Harpham that's not actually Harpham, and that would be Ruston Parva, and that's got a church of its own as well. Let's head up there and see what that one's about. Like Lothorpe, Ruston Parva used to be its own civil parish until 1935. It too was merged with Harpham to give us the modern boundaries. Its name literally means little farm where the rushes grow. Fun fact, Leeds-based band the Kaiser Chiefs originally named themselves Runston Parva after this very village. It has its own church and again, like Lothorpe, it's well out of the way. It sits on a hill high above the main village. To get to it, you have to pass first through a private drive and then up this narrow path. Take care, it's bumpy underfoot. A former medieval chapel once occupied this site, but the small church here today is Grade two listed and dedicated to St Nicholas. It was built in the Norman style in 1832 from ashlar and yellow brick, and it has a tower supported inside by cast iron pillars. Also inside, there's a two-deck pulpit and box pews, both of which also probably date from 1832. There's also a restored Romanesque cylindrical font. St Nicholas's Church belongs to the Burton Agnes Benefice, together with the buildings at Lothorpe, Harpham, and of course, Burton Agnes itself. In the main, the rest of Ruston Parva is residential, barring the odd business. In the Doomsday Book, Ruston Parva was recorded as Roriston, and the lordship of the manor was held by the canons of the Church of St John of Beverley. Keep that in mind because that fact will become important in Harpham itself. Ruston Parva was once much bigger. Around the village there's clear evidence of medieval occupation in the form of earthworks, a ridge and furrow field system, enclosures and a hollow way. In 1968, ditch remains of a moat were discovered at the southern end of the village which are believed to have once been part of a manor house. Let's make for Harpham via the A614 now, which passes Ruston Parva around half a mile away to the south. Between the two is a picnic site, Bracy Bridge, which occupies a loop on the former route of the road before it was straightened. If you stop here, there's often an excellent little mobile food van, which has, according to one online review, the best sandwiches ever. There are also some nice circular walks you can take from this spot too.
Okay folks, so with the, the light becoming an issue last night, I opted to go to the hotel in Bridlington and come out again in the morning. Now, you probably can't see much at the moment, but you will be able to see on the horizon, the sun is starting to rise. It's much easier to battle with low light in a morning than it is in the evening, because in the evening, the light is fading away in the morning, the light is coming to you. It's going to get lighter as you go. So I'm just going to stand here at the edge of Harpham just for a, a few minutes and uh, wait for the sun to come up a bit more. Our first landmark is literally right next to us here, which you probably can't see because it's so dark. However, modern technology does allow for things like torches on mobile phones these days. So we'll see how illuminated I can make this landmark with my torch on and the answer is not very <laughs> I don't know whether you can see it if I stand a bit closer there's a well there which you can't see very well at the moment pun intended but when it becomes a bit more light you'll be able to see it Using the torch on my phone, I was able to film the first of the two ancient wells in Harpham. This one is associated with St John of Beverley, who was born in Harpham in 640 AD. The well is said to have magically sprung forth from the ground when he struck the ground with his staff. Local tradition says that its water is useful for curing headaches and eye issues, overcoming fertility and helping calm animals. If you want to try those cures yourself though, well, you're out of luck. The water is inaccessible due to the iron railings surrounding its stone wellhead. There are several farms both in and around the village, but not all of the land here is arable. Instead, Harpham has plenty of historic earthworks. You can't see them, but the footpath we're on here to Daggett Lane crosses one particular well-pronounced patch. Harpham sits in an area rich in history. Even the Romans had a presence here. Six Roman mosaics were found in Harpham between 1905 and 1950. The first three are now in the Hull and East Riding Museum. One represented a rectangular maze, one of only five known examples in Britain. We've reached Daggett Lane's junction with Crossgates. It's still dark, but at least the phone box was all lit up. There wasn't much of note in that one, though. Much of this end of the village is residential. Crossgates itself is generally semi-detached dwellings, but there are some bigger and older houses at its southern end. We're approaching the entrance to the third church in this video, Harpham Zone. Given he was born here and the history connecting him to the well, this is dedicated to St John of Beverley. It really couldn't be to anyone else, could it? Although you can just about make out the outline of its tower in the darkness, this church is well worth a look in the daylight. It was built by Sir William St Quintin in the 14th century and contains some very fine memorials to members of the family, including an excellent pair of medieval brasses hidden under floor mats in the North Chapel. The churchyard in comparison is quite modest and a bit creepy in the dark. Next, we're going to follow a path which runs alongside the churchyard towards the eastern end of the village, and on the way, it passes a small sports club. Trust me when I tell you, that there is a lawn tennis club. It's the field behind this, though, that's way more interesting. In it, you'll be walking over some bumps and hollows, which are the earthwork remains of a medieval manor house, built by the St Quintin family. The St Quintin family were lords of Harpham Manor, and there are at least two landmarks in the village that bear their name. One of them can be found on Station Road. If you were to follow this, it would take you to the old railway station in Lothorpe, but we're more concerned here with St Quintin's Creamery. This occupies West End Farm. Whilst there are arable farms in the village, this is a dairy farm which processes and bottles milk produced by its herd of happy Holstein and Frisian cows. They offer 100% fresh local milk and cream straight off the farm too. You can't beat it when it's fresh. Back the other way now, our next landmark is also on Station Road, Harpham and Lothorpe Village Hall. This was built in 1933 and quickly established itself as a community hub thanks to the local Women's Institute. It's hosted loads of events in its time, including an annual produce show. 
Around the corner now, back onto Main Street, we find the parish notice board. Mark off Harpham, guys, it's in the books. Main Street is residential now, barring the pub, which is our last major landmark. Although before we get there, there's an information board to read. This details most of the history I've been talking about, but one thing that stands out here is the story behind the Drummer Boy's Well. That's the name given to the second of the two ancient wells in Harpham, located by the Manor House's earthworks. There's more on that, and the story, shortly. Here's the pub, this is the St Quintin Arms. According to its website, this was originally a 13th century coaching inn. I'm a bit dubious of that, because the UK's oldest coaching inn, located in Midhurst, is 15th century. Either way, it's also a B&B, so if you fancy a night away in Harpham, this is your go-to place. And after all, why wouldn't you? It's a village loaded with things to see and do, and it's peaceful to boot. You can reach all of it by way of a bus too, if you need to. Harpham is served by the number 121, but you have to catch it at Bracy Bridge, not here. Okay, so we've reached the end of the walk here on Butt Bulk, which runs up to the A614 towards Burton Agnes. Our last landmark, as you can see here, is either an old school or an old chapel, I'm not quite sure which. I can tell by the architecture it's probably an old school, but maybe you Harpham locals can fill me in on that one. It's very, very difficult walking around in the low light trying to film a village, but with four more to film today, I didn't really have any other option. I had to come out and do it this early in the morning. Hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, it's going to be okay when I put it all together. You'll have seen whether it's okay or not. There's a lot to be said for daylight. It's vastly underrated. Now, before we leave Harpen, we have to tell the story of the other well and how it got its name. It's called the Drummer Boy's Well because local legend tells of how a drummer boy met his death by drowning in it, but there are two theories as to how this tragic death happened. The first relates to William the Conqueror, who promised to grant the manor of Harpham to whoever reached it first. The quickest to arrive was a drummer boy, but close behind was a member of the St Quintin family, anxious to claim the land for himself. He's said to have thrown the boy down the well, where he died by drowning. The second, kinder version, says the St Quintin lord of the manor was watching an archery tournament in the field, when he accidentally jostled a drummer boy who lost his balance and fell into the well. Which tale is true? Well, we'll never know, so you can take your pick. Either way, a boy drowned in the well, and ever since, the sound of drumming can be heard emerging from it whenever the head of the St Quintin family is about to die. What a great tale! And let me know, Harpen folks, have you ever heard drumming from the Drummer Boy's Well? And that's that folks, Harpen Parish is in the books, and I truly hope that the lack of light hasn't completely ruined it. If anything, you can use this video to your advantage. I've given you the perfect excuse to go and visit Harpen in the broad daylight and see what I couldn't. In fact, if you do, send me some pictures, I'd love to see your efforts. Thanks for watching this video folks, don't forget to like this episode if you haven't already, it really makes a difference with YouTube. If you're new here, subscribe to the channel for more videos like this, and give us a share too if you've got friends who'd like it. You can find all the links to my social media accounts below, as well as my buy me a coffee page where you can donate to the channel. Also if you've enjoyed this episode, have a look at some more videos in this series. Until next time, I've been Andy, also known as the Village Idiot, and I'm out.